Today on Switched Linux, we will talk about Denmark beginning its journey to exit from Microsoft in some circumstances and why vendor lock-in is one of their big issues. Thanks for checking out this video by Switch to Linux. If you like this type of content, subscribe to the channel. If you've not already done so, leave us a like and a comment down below. And today we do want to talk about uh, Denmark is beginning to exit from Microsoft. This is several different countries and cities and things in the EU have been looking at digital sovereignty and realizing nearly every single big tech company is based out of the United States. And they don't like things like the Cloud Act and they don't like things like vendor lock-in and so this is causing some of them to start making the switch and I wanted to talk about this article because this really covers kind of the way I recommend people make a switch and that's you don't just go all in you go slow you experiment you test around in my own case uh, if you are unfamiliar with how I switched to Linux and all of the circumstances therein I saw the writing on the wall with Windows 10 before it was even released and I said there's no way I will run that now at that time I was also running Mac on some projects I had as well and I just do not like the Mac UI nor do I like the Mac ecosystem and so I was looking at other options and so I remember experimenting a little bit with Linux a number of years prior for a few other reasons and I remember that and I said let me look into that thing again and it ended up being a pretty good option but for several years in fact the first half of the life of this channel I ran Linux daily but I also still ran Mac and Windows almost daily keeping Windows 7 in a uh, more secure environment so I didn't have to make the switch to 10 but what I end up doing is I learned a lot more about Linux as I worked I slowly migrated my workflows from Windows over to Linux and then a few years before I moved into this mobile workstation which is 100% Linux I actually switched my workstation to a Raspberry Pi still having that Windows computer as a backup in the event I needed it and then I was able to make sure every bit of my workflow was working and in that time I was able to move my backup systems to a better Linux uh, infrastructure. I was able to build a network attached storage, which even operates here in this mobile workstation. And I was able to get all of my workflow for all the different projects and things, things that I do from professional writing and coaching in the writing area to the web design and business management type stuff and video content creation. And right now I'm actually experimenting with some AI servers and things like that. Uh, even though I think AI is a a serious dangerous problem I also think it's one of those technologies if we do not appropriately embrace it in a few appropriate ways we could potentially get left behind so I'm preparing for that and guess what Linux is at the center of that one too and so what they're doing here in Denmark is they're starting with one industry and uh, they are starting with not even everybody in that but they are migrating about 15,000 employees to entirely self-hosted self-controlled Linux based systems in order to make sure that they can actually make everything function they're doing it slow just like I did in my process so uh, of course, they kind of started out talking about, you know, get the SEO going in there. Um, they are um, uh, they are actually involved in this crazy VPN bill, which I, I looked at. I read everything over. And um, yeah, it's uh, there's some issues there. They also are a strong supporter of the EU chat control system, which is a serious problem. So I don't like that. However, the move away from Microsoft is actually a good approach they're doing. So they're starting with the road traffic authority and I'm not even going to attempt to pronounce that in their native language um, and uh, in this particular traffic authority what they're doing is they're taking a subset of people and they are replacing these with entirely open source and self-hosted options giving them full digital sovereignty and total control over everything that they are doing so they say um, they say down here that they are designed to replace Microsoft service with, with open source alternatives. With this, they are not stopping at just Office apps. They'll be replacing both Windows operating system and Microsoft suite of applications with open source alternatives. However, they have not told us exactly what those alternatives are. Uh, it's probably going to be some form of 
uh, probably an enterprise type grade uh, Linux distribution, maybe an LTS like Ubuntu or something like uh, in like the Red Hat area, um, like Fedora or something else, probably what they're going to do because they have that uh, capabilities of doing the professional support tiers. And that's probably what they're they're looking at there. Uh, they also could be using um, they could be using only Office. They could be using a Nextcloud infrastructure with Calibora. They could be using LibreOffice, which also has professional support contract options. But of course, everything is still locally hosted on your own platform. And so what they they haven't told us exactly what they're doing, but that's most likely what they're doing based on the information we have. The agency has 600 employees across 11 teams, and only some of them will be taken through the trans, uh, transition. They said, here's their reasoning. It's a question of being properly master of our own house and having full control over the data we have. At the Road Traffic Authority, we have some essential information. We really want to be sure we know where it is. And I love that phrase, a question of being properly master in our own house and having full control over the data we have. That is a phrase I have thought about without those exact words for the last several years because I do not like this idea that everything just cross syncs to the cloud and it's on somebody else's servers and who knows who has access to it for whatever reason and I don't care if it's not being used for advertising. I don't care. I don't want you to have it for anything. I don't consent. There you go. Uh, it's like that uh, uh, meme I saw on Twitter the other day. Uh, a little, it's a little pop-up on a Microsoft dialog box, and it says, Windows understands consent. Yes, I agree. Ask me again in three days. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so... Uh, they say if you make yourself too dependent on some supplier like Microsoft, you risk they charge too much. And so in that uh, aspect of it, they're saying, well, we if we have everything vendor locked in, we are at the mercy of whatever price they want to charge us. They say only a portion of their uh, workforce will go open source right now, but they aim up to have up to 15,000 government users across multiple state agencies moving to open source solutions after this narrow test. Now, of course, Microsoft's PR person uh, uttered their uh, corporate jargon. Microsoft solutions are competitively and fairly priced and used in the public sector because they combine high security with innovation and ineffective collaboration. We welcome competition and their Need not be a contradiction between open source and what Microsoft delivers. Okay, there's Microsoft being a PR company, but I really like what they're uh, what they're stressing here is that it, this is about data sovereignty, and uh, we did cover this, but it wasn't highlighted in my thumbnail, so you may not know I covered it. But in the video I did at the beginning of the week called "Cloudy with a Chance of Data Loss," that is about this particular person here who is a, a an actual professional author writing the professional books for O'Reilly talking about two of Apple's programming languages he about lost everything now in the update as of yesterday when I'm recording this uh, so two days ago when this is live he says he is back it took an executive relation person in Singapore and we did actually get what I speculated on in my video the the problem was is that the gift card he bought from a major retailer this is like Walmart size, Woolworth size store. Um, a gift card from a major retailer had been tampered with, and that is what caused the account lockage. Now, here is, of course, the fundamental problem. It should not take a guy with this much clout and this many professional contacts to get that level of help. If this was you off the street without a huge background, without a huge following, you would just be completely out of luck. You will have lost everything. Prior to that, uh, he did give us a couple of different updates, but prior to that, what happened is after having his Apple account for 25 years and being a professional author, uh, 30 years as a loyal Apple customer, authoring technical books on their own programming languages, Objective-C and Swift, he goes out and he's got tons of different services, so he fills these up with Apple gift cards. He goes into a massive, highly 
a respected chain of stores. He buys a gift card and he has full receipts. He didn't buy it on eBay or anything like that. He has a full receipt and statements from the actual retailer. That card had been tampered with. And this is something we have talked about this in the weekly news roundup where the supply chain for gift cards can be hacked and and breached and tampered with. And what they'll do is they'll get the the cards and then they'll just do it on a small portion of them at a time so as to not draw attention. But they'll get in there, they'll grab the codes, they'll reseal the packages, and then they'll wait for those cards to be activated and then they can steal the money uh, without the card actually being activated by the person who purchased it. And so that's what happened on this gift card. So he goes into the store, he buys the gift card to throw $500 into his Apple account to pay for six plus terabytes, uh, six terabytes of an Apple plus account. And that shuts everything down. It shut down the, um, obviously all of the access to the media. It shut down all the access to his files. Now I had speculated how would it shut down the devices after having some conversations with some Apple users in the intervening week since my first video, what has happened here is that Apple, of course, and I said, Hey, I haven't used Apple products in a while. Well, I stopped using Apple products right about the time they introduced, um, find my device. Well, with Find My Device, if you turn that on, it locks that hardware to your Apple account. So now that his Apple account has been deactivated, every one of his physical devices no longer work because the account on it are locked because the Apple thinks the device is stolen. That is how he not only lost access to all of his files, 20 years of photos and pictures and programming and everything else in the account, all of the music, all of the movies, he lost that. But because he had synced those Apple IDs to find my device, he also lost access to all of the physical devices as well. That is a fundamental problem with this vendor lock-in. So you are literally at the mercy of these companies, whether it be Apple or Google, or what's most terrifying right now is Microsoft, since they are trying to force everybody to have a Microsoft account. What if you engage in wrong think or buy a gift card from the wrong place and your entire account gets locked? Well, you can't get into your files anywhere. You On the Windows system, you can't even log into the device. You literally will be dependent on having all of your files in a complete completely accessible offline solution, which you can access with probably a Linux device because it'll let you boot. There's a thought. And so we have a fundamental problem with these big tech companies giving us vendor lock-in, chaining us inside this walled garden, and then having absolutely no means for recourse when some AI system completely wipes our account off the face of the planet and we have no way possible to contact anybody unless of course you happen to be the guy with a 30 year track record with Apple who's actually written all your technical manuals and even he had a hard time getting in he actually specified up here that he had actual friends in Apple who were not able to help him other than attempt to get his case escalated you think you got a chance of getting any of your data back? And this is why I look at the Linux ecosystem and I say, I am in control. I can manage this. I am going to. And by the way, if you go, well, I'm just a computer guy. I couldn't manage all this kind of stuff. I got news for you. Yes, you can. You are more capable than you think you are. Uh, you just need to sit down, watch some videos on this stuff, read some things, tinker around. But... Going back to Denmark, they're doing it with a small subset of employees in one particular situation because that is the way you want to do it. You want to start now, but while you still have access, let me tell you this, while you still have access to your files, whether you're using Google or Apple or Microsoft or Dropbox or anywhere else, you make sure you go out to the store, you spend a hundred or $200 on some external USB drives. Um, probably like uh, uh, external storage drives, you know, like the two, three terabyte drives that you can get. Plug those bad boys in. Make sure you have an offline archive of every important file you have. Make sure it's 
easily accessible, verify it's there, and you might even check to make sure you can access those files on a different computer. Because if those accounts get shut down, you will lose everything. But you do that first, and then you start experimenting. It's not that hard to get a $100 Raspberry Pi or or a cheap computer off of Craigslist that somebody thinks is, is completely useless, but it works fine just because, you know, this computer can't have Windows 11. I guess it's not secure. Buy that bad boy up for 50 bucks, throw Debian on it, install Open Media Vault, and you will have yourself an amazing computer that will be able to store all these things locally for you, and it is far easier than you think far easier than you think. One of my friends has actually done this. They had they had an old laptop from college and he graduated a long time ago that is now their TV PC. They have another old computer from the house. They converted that into Open Media Vault and they got like 12 terabytes of data storage in there and it's going great for them. They can access their files. They have solid backups. They know where everything is and if accounts get suddenly terminated, they have access to everything. But you start doing that now and then you slowly progress your way into total freedom and you will slowly it's kind of like taking that spoon and digging your way out underneath that walled garden just dig yourself out of that walled garden with free and open source software that's under your control if you're going to use cloud services make sure you control them and they're not tied to accounts that can easily be shut down if you are using those types of accounts make sure you have accounts in multiple different places under multiple different email addresses multiple different like make them look like two completely different people that way, if one of them gets shut down, you don't get like, uh, oh, hey, uh, Apple says this guy's bad. Okay, I guess I'll shut them down too, says Microsoft. You don't want to get into a situation where that could happen to you. That would be actually terrifying as well. So take this slow step, march towards installing Linux on your devices. So let me know your thoughts about all that in the comments down below.